Welcome and thank you very much for joining us today uh, for this session of Flinders University's Meet the Minds, which is uh, wonderfully named Aliens in Antarctica, Expanding Engagement Through Art and Technology. Uh, my name is Alan Sicolo from the uh, Flinders University Meet the Minds team, and I'm excited to host today's event as we learn more about Dr. Sean Williams' upcoming trip to Antarctica to finish his novel. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that we are hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all the nations upon which Flinders operates. So this event is delivered as part of our Meet the Minds lunchtime lecture series, where you get to meet some of Flinders University's most engaging minds as they bring their latest research to, um, to you and a diverse range of uh, audiences from a diverse range of fields. Uh, today, we're really fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Sean Williams. Uh, Sean is a senior lecturer here at the uh, College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences here at Flinders University. Sean is an award-winning number one New York Times best-selling author of 50 novels and over 120 short stories for adults, young adults and children. As the first ever writer to uh, winter through the Australian Antarctic program, Dr. Sean Williams has a full set of projects designed to capture the challenges of living in one of the, most, in the Earth's most uh, isolated places. Uh, building on his 2016 Australian Antarctic Fellowship. His plans for 2023 include creative research as well as reaching out to diverse Australian audiences and teaching students at Flinders while using technologies barely dreamt of a century ago. As always, uh, we're really keen to make this session as interactive as possible um, with live question and answers. So um, if uh, you'd like to participate, please do so um, using the uh, Q&A function um, in the other platform. Uh, we do ask, however, that everyone uh, please uh, treat this forum as a place of respectful engagement where people are treated with dignity and where differing views are tolerated. I think we're uh, ready to start receiving questions now, so please uh, feel free to use the function. Um, but so, um, you know, without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Sean Williams uh, to, to speak. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I too would like to acknowledge the Ghana people, uh, the history of storytelling. Uh, and storytellers, past, present and future. Uh, it's a wonderful tradition that uh, we're all tapping into here on Ghana land, unceded Ghana land. So yes, um, I'm here to talk about my um, experiences in Antarctica and the experiences I uh, plan to have in the uh, not so distant future. So this talk, um, as you mentioned, Alan, is called Aliens in Antarctica, Expanding Engagement Through Arts and Technology. Um, who are the aliens in Antarctica? I mean, humans are in the first instance. Antarctica is a space that has uh, no indigenous mammalian life, uh, apart from the occasional peng penguin. Uh, humans are native to Antarctica. We are very much an alien species in that world. Uh, expanding engagement, uh, using what technologies, with whom, uh, through art and technology, how, and why. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll just mention before I go any further that all the photos uh, popping up on the PowerPoint uh, were taken by me in 2016. Uh, the ones, one that's on your screen right now was taken en route to Casey Station uh, from the Wilkins Aerodrome on the day of my arrival in 2017. So hopefully we'll give you a sense if you peer into the screen of the uh, uh, the flat uh, icy expanses uh, and the beautiful blueness in the water and the icebergs in in the distance. It's um, an absolutely unique vista. So um, there are numerous bodies around the world um, whose job it is to maintain uh, research stations in Antarctica and as part of their um, duties they um, uh, have various programs that are designed to raise awareness of the activities of their Antarctic programs, um, the importance of the unique and uh, Arctic and subantarctic natural environment, uh, the humans' stories and endeavours uh, from the, the from the age of heroic exploration of Antarctica to the present day. Um, they are keen to raise awareness of historical Antarctic and subantarctic legacies. And um, moving forward into the future, um, from the recent past, uh, the importance of the international treaty history and the values and cooperation that shape Antarctica's geopolitical uh, significance, particularly as that treaty is up for negoti negotiation at the moment. Australia's version of that body um, responsible for Antarctic engagement on scientific and infrastructure and arts fronts is the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, 
and uh, they uh, have part of their key remit an engagement of through the arts between uh, people in Antarctica and the people in Australia. And um, the arts has always been important to Antarctic exploration. Um, it's been a valuable contributor to mental health. Um, the earliest explorers understood this, that when you're trapped on the ice for years at an end, you need to have something to do. Otherwise, there's a serious risk of um, mental illness. Some of the earliest explorers brought whole printing presses down with them and whole pianolas onto the ice, which when you consider that they were traveling in wooden ships, often sail or fueled by coal, um, uh, every kilogram counted. So when you're um, farrowing enormously expensive, uh, almost enormously heavy pieces of equipment like that, you can see the value placed on it. This tradition, this this sense of value of creative expression in the arts is uh, continued to today. Um, in Casey Research Station, they have a full kit for a band there and a rehearsal room. Um, people photograph constantly down there and um, uh, there are numerous costumes and festivals and perform uh, theatrical performances that happen down there. So as well as the uh, the artistic uh, practices of the people on the base, the there is an importance uh, placed on creative engagement to cultural understanding of the history and importance in Antarctica. After all, most people who live on the mainland um, don't get to visit Antarctica in person. So our understanding of Antarctica comes through novels, TV shows, um, music, etc. So it comes through media that is created by artists and how those representations of Antarctica, Antarctic history, uh, how they're made is critical to our ongoing relationship with one of the most fragile environments on Earth. Uh, and one that is critical to our understanding of past and future climate change, just to name uh, one particular issue that's facing at the moment. Um, and bodies such as the AID, AAD, Australian Antarctic Division, regard the funding of creative engagements as a fundamental part of their, their remit. Now, since the 80s, uh, the AAD uh, has been sending artists to Antarctica. Um, and these days this happens in partnership with ANAT, the Australian Network for Arts and Technology, uh, which kicks in some funding and uh, helps with the selection process. Um, recipients of the Arts Fellowship include um, the writer Jesse Blackadder, Philip Samasis, the sound recorder, who has who this year will complete a, a sound archive of the natural sounds of every Australian research station. Um, the animator Julie Rose, photographer Martin Walsh, Alice Giles was a harpist who was sent down there with her full scale concert harp uh, a couple of years ago. And she's actually the great granddaughter of Cecil Madigan, one of the men who traveled with um, uh, with Douglas Mawson. So you can see that there's a wide diversity of artists sent down to Antarctica. Now, my journey um, to Antarctica um, began uh, a, a long time ago um, and uh, it rose out of my creative practice. So before I started at Flinders University a couple of years ago, I was a full time supporting artist and uh, a writer and I came to the Academy to pursue practical creative research that uh, may not be commercially viable as well as continuing my creative uh, career. So when I say creative research, um, I mean research that happens alongside traditional work research and sometimes overlapping with traditional research. Uh, it's usually practice based or often practice based practice based research incorporating the act of making something into the mythology or research output. Um, creative research finds new ways of understanding, situating and reconfiguring, reconfiguring knowledge, knowledge motivated by curiosity and informed by existing knowledge. It's not just sitting down and making stuff up. It's existing in a body of work that precedes us and is happening, happening around us, uh, both creative work and critical work. And creative research creates new knowledge uh, through interrogation and disruption. So um, in the process of continuing my my former creative work at Flinders University, um, my previous Antarctic work and my future Antarctic work will continue seamlessly. Um, on the image on the screen at the moment, you can see a picture of me holding a book. This is me uh, just before I went to Antarctica um, holding a one of the books that was printed in Antarctica on the the uh, the only printing press in Antarctica. It was written by Mawson and his his expeditioners, and it contains the only piece of creative writing um, known to have been written by Douglas Mawson. So it was an amazing thing to have experienced while I was there. And the blue ice in the background is the runway of Wilkins Aerodrome, which enables people to fly in and out of KC Research Station. 
So with that, uh, the um, the uh, the creative research uh, practice that I pursued before, um, uh, I was drawn to uh, pursue Antarctica because of a book that I read when I was a, a young man. And this book opens with these words, um, the worst desert on earth never gets hot. It boasts no towering sand dunes like the Sahara, no miles and miles of barren gravel as does the Gobi. The winds that torment this empty land make those that sweep over the rub al Kali seem like spring breezes. And this depiction of Antarctica as an absolute absolutely unique desert was so at odds with my um, received perception of Antarctica as a land of ice uh, that I was immediately fascinated by it and drawn to it. That book, by the way, is by Alan Dean Foster. It's the novelization of the movie The Thing, the John Carpenter 1981 version, one of the most famous works associated with Antarctica and the source of many traditions in Antarctica itself. Uh, in midwinter, uh, the wintering staff all over the continent stopped to watch The Thing again, probably to freak themselves out, but uh, why not? Uh, another author that's engaged with Antarctica is uh, the American author Kim Stanley Robinson, who uh, visited Antarctica on one of America's own equivalents of the Arts Fellowship. I met him while he was on his way down there in 1995. Um, I had never heard of such things as the Arts Fellowship before, and it was him who, in, who illuminated me to the fact that governments do pay artists to go down. And I decided that I would apply as soon as I had a few more publications under my belt. So when my second novel came out, I applied to go on the Arts Fellowship and was knocked back um, because my project wasn't quite suitable. Uh, but I decided to try again in 2015, and that was probably inspired by seeing snow for the first time in Hobart. Uh, having grown up in Adelaide in Australia, I didn't know what snow was like. I didn't know whether I'd like it down in Antarctica, fascinated though I was. But um, uh, having survived the snow of Hobart, I decided that I would apply again. And uh, this time I took very close attention to what the Antarctic uh, Division was looking for from their fellowships. And I built up my application based on similar experiences I'd had down the years. One of those experiences was a residency called The Artists, which was funded by ANAT, in which myself and three other artists were locked into a sleep study for a week in which there were no clocks, no windows, no sense of time. And we were scrutinized 24 hours a day in order to see how this would affect our creativity. Uh, so I survived that and I thought maybe Antarctica could be useful, uh, uh, could be something that I would survive as well. I'd also had a residency at um, in Canberra, uh, a residency at the old Parliament House and the Museum of Australian Democracy, where I first discovered Sir George Reid, whose quotes you will see on the screen here. And um, he was Australia's fourth prime minister only for a few months, but um, he was the first member of parliament to resign twice and Australia's first high commissioner in London. A really interesting character uh, and a very popular witty speaker of his time, but you wouldn't know this from his biography, which is incredibly boring, except for these really useful quotes, um, which inspired me to uh, take a chance on applying for um, a fellowship. And uh, particularly the last one, there is no nobler aim than the world's uh, there is a nobler aim. Whoops, that's a Freudian slip. There is a nobler aim than the world's applause, spoken like a true writer, <laughs> desperate for people's, people's approval. So with these residencies behind me and with my interest in Antarctica, I decided to apply again. The photo here shows me in my boots standing on the ice. Um, you might be wondering why I have purple laces on my boots. This is because everybody wears the same boots in Antarctica and it's impossible to tell them apart. So as you walk into the residential area, you see a giant pile of boots. How do you tell yours from anybody else's? Um, people personalize them by, um, by putting ribbons on them or coins or other means. And little details like this is why I particularly wanted to go to Antarctica. So um, I did receive the fellowship. Um, I did go down in 2017 on the 2016 Antarctic uh, Australian Antarctic Division Australian Arts Fellowship. It's a very long title. Um, my original plan was to write a uh, to research and write a novel called Lone Soul Standing, um, the title of which is taken from a Douglas Mawson quote from one of his diaries written while I was in Antarctic Antarctica, comparing the landscape of Antarctica to the surface of Mars. Uh, my story was going to be about Douglas, a young Douglas Mawson. Um, traveling with Scott and Shackleton. They never travel together in the real life. Uh, in the wake of HG Wells' War of the Worlds. And um, it's at this point that my wife goes, 
what? I was with you up until the War of the Worlds, but the reason why I uh, wanted to explore this creative conjunction of an existing literary property and real history uh, arose out of several things in real life. One, I'm friends with Emma McEwen, who's um, Sir Douglas Mawson's great granddaughter, uh, and it seemed uh, you know, a great opportunity to use her knowledge in a book. Um, Aliens in Antarctica has been done before as per the thing, but War of the Worlds has not, to my knowledge. Um, my wife is a professor of colonial history, and um, I've imbued through osmosis a few interests in those areas, and it seemed that uh, hate, uh, War of the Worlds, which is a critique of the British Empire, married quite well to the Federation of Australia and my interest in George Reid uh, in creating a story that speculated how um, a young Australia in the wake of the Great War, this one being the War of the Worlds, uh, might have changed our national character um, in the future. So um, that's why I went down there. Um, what I discovered while I was down there was a whole bunch of other really interesting things, apart from the issues of the boots, um, uh, I got to experience the wonderful culture that exists in Casey Research Station uh, and uh, meet the people who work down there. I explored a whole bunch of weird spaces. My mission was to not say no to any opportunity. So when somebody said, would you like to come down into the crawl spaces? I would say yes. If, if a bunch of guys said, we're going to dig out a pipe in the snow, I would say yes. And, and that led that specific thing led me to getting sunburnt in Antarctica, which is something that I didn't anticipate happening. Um, I got to eat a homemade pizza on, on, on the only wood burning stove in the entire continent. Wood has to be shipped in because there are no trees on Antarctica. So that was an amazing experience. I got to watch the thing down there. Now these these experiences may seem like um, I was there on holiday <laughs> having a good time, but this kind of research gathering exercise is the meat and drink of creative research. It's where ideas come from and these ideas may then go on to be transformed formed into new works um, built using the knowledge of storytelling and critical theory that we bring to our particular research area. Um, the picture there on the right is me wearing my full Antarctic gear for the very first time the day before I left and uh, I tell you it was really really hot in there even in Hobart um, but you need the bare minimum of that just to survive a really really cold day down there as, as well as all the uh, um, my objectives and my my opportunities that came while I was down there there were inevitably obstacles so weather is something that has been a constant bugbear for anybody traveling to Antarctica um, everything gets delayed or foreshortened um, um, my trip was actually shortened. I had to come back early because of a blizzard that was rolling in and I had to go back late. Uh, I had to arrive there late because of a rather inconvenient election. Everybody who goes down there down there in the Arts Fellowship has to be signed off by the minister. We had an election that year and the minister wasn't appointed until quite late. So I didn't get down there until like the last flight going in. Uh, I was only there for nine days, which unfortunately wasn't long enough to do all the research that I wanted to do. Uh, and when you combine that with a few technical problems, I didn't get the writing done that I needed to do. Also, I discovered when I got back that the War of the Worlds was coming out of copyright that year. So the market was completely flooded by War of the Worlds spin-offs and sequels and novelizations. So there was no room for my book. However, I did do a bunch of other things while I was there. And when I came back, wrote a lot of short stories and uh, remixed and articles and did presentations at the Royal Society and things like that. I wrote a blog, the link of which is there on the screen. So um, as with every creative and probably every research um, exercise, um, there were unexpected surprises and uh, unplanned frustrations that led to me wanting very, very much to go back. So having now started at Flinders, um, where I have an increased a uh, number of research opportunities and uh, some absolutely wonderful colleagues who are also interested in in um, Antarctica, I decided that I would try to go back, uh, this time to spend longer down there. In fact, this time to winter down there. No Australian writer has wintered as part of the Australian Fellowship. Um, I decided that I would try to and that would ensure that I would get all the time I needed. So with um, Flinders as a partner and uh, organisations within Flinders such as Assemblage as a partner um, with colleagues at other universities, uh, one of whom Elizabeth Lean at UTAS, um, I've got a, a discovery project ARC application currently under consider consideration. Um, I decided to assemble a um, an application that would be 
larger and more substantial and uh, a, a little bit less than just a creative application, not just, just to go down and write a book. The AAD wants wintering staff to be kept very busy so no one will get bored. Um, so I had to come up with uh, lots of ways to fully experience the weather, the isolation, the culture, and take advantage of the time. Uh, since my last trip, I've been writing music, so that was uh, an important part of my application. The cover on the screen at the moment is my novel, Ice, uh, my album Isolation, which came out during, was composed and released during lockdown last year. Um, I've also begun podcasting with my colleagues, uh, Alex Vickery Howe and Amy Matthews. So podcasting, I figured would be a part of this proposal and teaching too. Um, I thought, why not teach from down there using technologies undreamt of in Mawson's time. Um, why not give it a crack and see what happens? We also have those colleagues like John Long and Alessandro Antonello who are here at Flinders and have um, um, you know, great experience and great interest in Antarctica. So let's try and see if we can sort something out uh, that might interest the AAD and give me the fellowship. Now, anybody who's um, um, applied for anything at all before will know that quite often things don't get off in the first application. Um, it took me four applications for them to decide to send me to Antarctica. In fact, I did not get the Arts Fellowship in the end. They decided to send me down as part of the Arts Program. So the Arts Fellowship for 2023 is going to somebody else, but I will be sent down uh, in 2023 to pursue this project that you see on the screen. I'll probably be visiting Mawson Research Station this time. It's the largest Australian research station uh, and the furthest away. It is uh, four and a half thousand kilometres away, uh, five and a half thousand kilometres away from Hobart um, uh, and is one of the, the first stations established there. I will be um, travelling on the new um, ship which went into service this year. I will aim to finish Lone Son Standing or Mawson's Martian, whichever I decide to call it. Um, it has expanded a little bit in concept since that original book. I will create a new album of music uh, using sounds from within the station itself, trying to capture this the essence of what it's like being isolated down at the bottom of the world. Um, I will teach um, the fantastic a topic I run here in creative writing using Antarctic texts such as The Worst Journey in the World by Asprey Cherry Girard and um, maybe even the novella that inspired the thing. I'll do a podcast um, about station life, answering questions uh, from people on the mainland and uh, more as, as things arise. Um, I've been talking with colleagues about a possible theatre projects, workshops for other wintering expeditioners. Uh, Veed is interested in me taking reference photos down there um, and so on and so forth. So this is the plan for 2023. It seems a long way off, uh, but it will come very, very quickly, I am sure. And um, and who knows what um, obstacles and um, uh, opportunities will arise along the way. Um, there'll be about a thousand people living with me in Antarctica while I'm down there, which creates, again, interesting opportunities for um, um, interesting intersections of knowledge. So I won't really be a lone soul down there like uh, Douglas Mawson probably was around about then. Uh, and I'll be among the aliens in Antarctic expanding uh, engagement with audience of students and beyond through novels, podcasts, music, any other means I can find using modern technologies such as modern, uh, such as the Anari Sat, uh, which gives 24 hour internet connection from Antarctica to anywhere in the world. Um, generating new research through um, uh, creative practice led activities to promote a more complete understanding of one of the most unique natural environments in the world before it is gone forever. That's that's my brief. That's what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Sean. Thank you. It's um, so fascinating. I, you know, Antarctica has always been a, a place that uh, you know I, I've dreamed about. So um, you know, I, I'm jealous. I I, uh, I don't know how I'd cope, but I'm I'm, I'm jealous. And um, I'm really wonderful actually to hear that uh, the arts has always been had a place um, in the exploration of Antarctica, uh, um, and also to hear your your process for for inspiration as well. Um, we are starting to get a few questions through now, um, which we'll get to. But I guess the, the first one I, I had and it's come through as well is. How do you actually prepare for a trip like this, uh, both physically and mentally? Um, what, what, what do you need to do? Do you want to spend six months down there? Um, I know you've been before, so you've, you kind of understand a, a little bit about what to, to expect, but uh, that was a lot, lot shorter, I understand. So how, how are you physically and mentally preparing? 
Well, one of the first things that I'll be doing will be growing a big beard. So you might have seen in, an, in one of the photos that I showed that I did have a beard. Um, I had I just basically stopped shaving for about six months and looked like a woolly pirate. Uh, it was terrible, but it uh, made a huge difference um, while I was down there just keeping the cold off my face. And one of the returning um, scientists down there, one of the returning uh, people said that is a proper Antarctic beard, you know, a good practical <laughs> beard. So I'll definitely be doing that. Um, you do need to pass a very stringent psychological and physical um, examination. They want people who are healthy, who won't get sick um, either way. There were early uh, explorers who did become very ill and they're very keen to avoid that. They obviously don't want anybody dying down there because that would be you know, yeah. traumatic and upsetting and, and problematic in lots of ways. So I guess my preparation will be to stay fit and healthy until I'm on the boat. Uh, and um, that may entail um, perhaps losing a bit of weight, although that's not a huge problem, but um, always better to be as healthy as possible. Mm. As far as isolation goes, I quite like um, dark, confined places. The sleep study suited me very well, um, and um, my time down in Antarctica showed that I, I quite liked the living spaces down there. Um, you mm. are in summer, you're crammed into spaces with a large number of people. In winter, you have a lot more space to be yourself uh, and there's less pressure um, on wintering staff compared to summering staff to be able to find little nooks and crannies where you can just be alone. The hydroponic um, station um, container down there was a, a real favourite spot for people to go because there was something much like natural sunlight and mm. it was very green. They were living things there and it was quite often empty and you could go there, read a book and not be surrounded by people. So um, I think I'll be OK. I'm sure I'll be OK. What, what, what do you think will be the biggest challenge you're going to face while you're there though? Oh, being away from family will be really hard um, and um, not being able to watch current television. That's going to be hard. Um, I'll have to I'll come back six months out of date. All my favorite. So is, there, yeah, is, is there Wi-Fi? <laughs> there is Wi-Fi, um, but there's restrictions on data. So um, things like scientific data, um, uh, official transmissions on Zoom, et cetera, take priority over the latest episode of um, you know, whatever's big, The Witcher, Witcher season five might be on then. I won't be able to watch any of that. So um, that will be, or that'll be tough. But um, in, in terms of deprivations, you know, it's pretty comfortable down there. And there's mm. lots of great food. Um, I hear people start to miss fresh food, um, particularly fruit like uh, bananas, tomatoes, fresh tomatoes. Um, you can't grow those things down there. So people start to get intense cravings, um, particularly after 18 months or so. <laughs> Strawberries. So, great thing. I'm keen to understand, um, you know, what uh, your students might expect from you while you're down there. I know that you're, you're looking to do some teaching and you're doing some podcasting, etc. But what can they expect? Well, we'll be looking at um, We'll be looking at texts that are set in Antarctica so uh, and may have been written by people who'd never been to Antarctica. So comparing physical descriptions of, of texts, either realists or fantastic, with the actual environment, well, I think will be an interesting exercise. As part of um, this topic, students will have the opportunity to write texts set in Antarctica, and I will be right there to do the research they need. So if they have a particular detail they need to know about or want to know about how something will feel. I'm right there to be their experimental subject, their, their eyes and ears in Antarctica to help them write, because that is one of the most difficult things about being a writer, particularly of things in the fantastic genre. Uh, you know, you can't travel forward in time to you know, the, the worlds of yeah. Asimov's foundation. You can't travel backwards in times or to alternate universes, but um, um, getting experiences from somebody in those environments can be incredibly valuable. Um, and what about yourself? Um, we've got a question come through. Are you reading any, you know, winter diaries in preparation? Um, like from Mawson and, and the like, you sound like you've already read that. But Oh, I, I, I really like reading Antarctic uh, accounts. Um, the Worst Journey in the World is one of the best books I've ever read. Um, uh, his, as a Cherry Asprey, uh, Cherry, uh, his his nickname, Cherry's account of seeking the eggs of the emperor penguin in the depths of winter is one of the most exciting and gripping accounts I have ever read. It is so brilliant. It feels like a novel. You really feel like you're there and it's amazing that these men survived. And so yes, I do read them. I'm about to read Madigan's diaries. Um, he was on Mawson's missions. Um, 
there's lots of accounts that I'm very keen to read because they will inform the novel itself. So reading the accounts of people who knew Mawson, who uh, traveled with him. Um, yeah, I really enjoy reading that kind of material. So that, that will be part of my research preparation too. I've got to get that list off you when we get out of here. <laughs> Another question's come through around, you know, what difficulties do you think you'll anticipate um, creating art over there in, in the winter and, and in the isolation? What challenges will you face? Well, if I need to uh, uh, purchase uh, any particular items off Amazon, to uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's obviously not going to be possible. And you never know. You never know what will be important. What uh, um, I don't know if I'll be able to buy books on my Kindle. Um, I'm certainly hoping so. So if a text, uh, either creative or academic, is released that is relative to my research, I may not be able to get it. I'm pretty sure that a Kindle file I'd be able to get from Antarctica, but say a, a music file or a TV show um, that would, if I can't get them, that will have an impact on my creative practice. Because I'm a fairly sedentary creator, um, all the music and the words that I write, I do from my computer. Um, I can pretty much do that anywhere. Um, but it is important to have fallow time away from the computer, away from the creative practice in order to let the subconscious kind of muse and work. And I'll be looking for ways to do that down there. Um, part of that will come through general station life. So everybody who's in the station in summer or winter is expected to contribute to the many chores that need to be performed, um, cleaning and cooking, uh, etc. cetera. So um, that's called slushy duty. And I did that one of the days while I was down there, I helped the, the cooks, I, it was basically doing like four hours of cleaning dishes and then helping taping rubbish to the compactor because every piece of rubbish has to be taken back home to oh, Australia. Nothing is left, yes. nothing is burned in Antarctica. It's all taken back home. So um, I'll be doing that kind of thing too. And everybody seems to do two or three things down there. So um, there will be lots of little jobs that I might be able to pick up. There was one person who was an IT operator down there who took it on himself to be the person who raised and lowered the flags on the flagpole uh, every day. And uh, that was an interesting role that they took on. It wasn't something that was required for them to do, but they said it was fascinating because there were all these rules and regulations about flag raising mm. and lowering that they didn't knew and didn't know and they had found that really useful in their long stay to keep their mind engaged in interesting ways so i'll be looking for those kind of hobbies while i'm down there to, to, to learn uh, new things and i'm sure you won't get bored <laughs> oh no there's no chance they, they were concerned that i wouldn't have enough to do and i i kept saying i'll think of new things to do i'll write another book <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we're, we're running low on time, but I did have one other question for you. And you know, what advice do you have for anyone out there listening today um, that might be considering a career in, you know, creative arts research? Well, I um, I think um, some of the best advice is to just get in there and start doing it. First of all, um, um, when you're right, working creatively, you can start creative write, writing. You can start creating right now. Um, you already have a wealth of knowledge in your mind and a wealth of understanding of creative practices that you have absorbed just by being alive in a world that's saturated with uh, with media. So get started now. But um, if you're interested in pursuing it as a as a career professionally or in the academy or both, um, it's really useful to start looking at other people's work with a more critical eye, or a bit more of a, an analytical bent to see what works, why it works, um, how it works, who it works for, who produces this work. Try and look at what's going on behind the screen to see um, what you like what is the secret to the things that you like or don't like and it's also worth engaging with things like criticism through reviews or the many books that are written in the areas that you're interested in and to engage with peers through say if you're a writer you might start going to your local writer center um, events or attending writers weeks or just uh, generally um, hanging out with other writers. We we have events here through Flinders and we were about to kickstart our reading events again. So they're good things to come along to hear what other writers are writing, meet other new writers, new artists like yourself and uh, don't give up. Remember those quotes from from Sir George Reed earlier in this presentation. You know, he uh, he was a very, very wise man. Don't give up. Pursue what you love and do it for the love of it. Great advice. <laughs> awesome, Sean. Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic discussion today and, and presentation. Um, unfortunately, our, our time is up, but I really want to thank you very much for sharing your time and the knowledge with us. 
and and wish you all the best for the upcoming trip. And I um I think we we definitely need to get you back uh, <laughs> to, to give us an update. Um, hopefully while you're over there, if we can get the uh, the Wi-Fi bandwidth uh, working, uh, that would be wonderful. Update, yeah, that'd be great. Yes, you'll see me with my big beard. Yeah, that's right. We'll do a before and after shot. Yeah, uh, but I would great. like to also thank the audience and, and the, for the great questions and input that have come through today. It's, uh, it's, it's been great to, to get your um, your engagement. Uh, and remember that you can watch this session again uh, on the Flinders YouTube channel um, or the uh, Flinders University Meet the Minds web pages. Um, we do have another uh, Meet the Minds session coming up um, on the 4th of November. It's um, That one's on the cultural, cultural diversity and sex education, catering to all young people in the classroom. Um, that's with uh, Monique Mulholland um, at 12.30 p.m. on the 4th of November. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. Um, and in the meantime, thank you very much um, and enjoy the rest of your day.